Hi, I'm Ray Parker Jr. and we're in Los Angeles at my home. Well, I got started in the music at age six. I had a band called the Stingrays, and this is a true story, true story. Uh, in kindergarten, they had these dances, kind of Russian dances you had to do, and you had to switch partners from one girl to the next girl. I just didn't like it. I wasn't in the girls at six years, so I just didn't want to do it. And uh, believe it or not, I actually went to the principal of the school at six years old and said, is there something else I can take instead of this gym class or this dance class? And she said, yeah, there's one other thing you can do, it's music. And I was totally not interested at all. And I walked into the music room, and I'll never forget the teacher's name is Alfred T. Kirby, who I've dedicated my new CD to. And uh, he said, well, what instrument would you like to play? We have rentals here for $8 for the semester. You can take one home. Well, obviously, I wasn't going to pick the tuba, right? So I picked the flute. And the flute wasn't available, so I picked the clarinet. And then I noticed that in that class was my neighbor down the street and my other neighbor around the block. And one guy's name is Nathan Watts, who's still the uh, band director for Stevie Wonder today. The other guy is Ollie Brown, who's played with the Rolling Stones and had hit records on his own. And we're all still friends today. And so my music teacher of six years old looked at me and said, uh, he could see that I was the least interested, so I didn't know this till years later. But he says, we're going to name this band the Stingrays. Sting, R-A-Y. And I guess he was making it, putting my name in it because he could tell I wasn't really into it. The other two guys were already in band class. And he helped us do uh, uh, PTA meetings. We played for orphanages and stuff like that. And that really was the propelling you know, thing that got me into music. Oh yeah, also I grew up in Detroit, Michigan. And I wasn't but maybe 10 blocks from Motown, from the original Motown building. Uh, my neighborhood was full of, full of musical people. Even Casey Kasem lived on the corner from where I grew up. <laughs> Maybe, you know, 15 years earlier, but the same street. Uh, Diana Ross lived in that neighborhood. The Temptations lived in that neighborhood. Um, Marvin Gaye lived in that neighborhood. So it was a lot of musical, you know, influential people there. And it, it was just an interesting thing. I switched to the guitar at about age 9 or 10 because I was starting to get taller. And me blowing that clarinet, Ollie by that time had gotten a bigger drum set, and they were drowning me out. I couldn't hear myself. So one day I saw the Loving Spoonfuls on TV playing What a Day for a Daydream. I think it was the Ed Sullivan show. And they showed him plugging in the guitar into an amplifier. Don't ask me why, but he had a white Stratocaster, and they showed him plugging the, the, the plug in the guitar, plugging in the amp, and the electrical part of it just turned me on. Probably one of my proudest moments is when Stevie Wonder called me. Because music for my mind was about my favorite album at the time. And I only had one album in my car, and that was music for my mind. And so when he called to have me join his band, I thought it was some of my friends playing a joke on me. And I kept hanging up the phone. <laughs> it's really a true story. I think I must have hung up on him at least three, four times. And he called back saying, you know, we keep getting disconnected. And I'm like, ah, nah, I said some not so nice words, click, you know. And finally he called me back, and what I'll never forget he said, this is really Stevie Wonder, and I'm going to prove it to you. Well, okay, I got, a, I got five seconds for that. And he played me the rhythm track to Superstition. And that was the first time. Once I heard that mood come in and the clavinets, I was like, oh, my gosh. This is, you know, I've been hanging up the telephone on Stevie Wonder. And so for me, that was a big, big moment in my life. Am I happy that I chose a life of music? Okay, I grew up in Detroit. My father worked at Ford Motor Company for 45 years. And if it wasn't for music, this close to being one of those guys who goes to work every day in the exact same location for 45 years. And remember, my dad did it. I'm not putting it down. He supported the family, and I love him for it, and I bought him a house and retired him later and the whole thing. But the, for me, the type of person that I am, is no way in the world I could go anywhere for five years, the exact same thing, and do it the same way every day. Somebody capped my income and say, this is all you're going to make is this much money, Forget about that Bentley and that Mercedes. It'll never be yours. This is it. It's impossible for me to do. And I remember as a kid, I, used to, you know, I told my dad, in fact, one of the big things was me leaving college to go pursue my music when Stevie Wonder called. And I told my dad, I said, Dad, you may as well just shoot me now. There's no way in the world I'm going to do drafting at Chrysler. I'm just not going to do it. I, I can't do this. This isn't in my spirit. It's not me. And, you know, it was one of the hardest conversations in my life because my dad had already pre-programmed where my life was going. He was so excited that I was going to be, I guess you call it a white collar worker as opposed to a blue collar worker. He says, my son's not going to be in the factory with getting grease on his hands. He's going to sit in the office. Well, in my mind, I had gone past that 
And for me, just sitting in the office every day <laughs> doing what somebody told me to do, she still could just throw me out the window and get over it. And so when we finally, you know, I'll never forget the big breakup was when I decided to get in my car and just drive off to California and do it, you know. And uh, fortunately for me, the results came pretty quick. And a few years later, I was retiring my father. I bought him a nice home in Detroit and had it decorated like a magazine and bought him a new car. And we all lived happily ever after. You know? My father didn't really understand it, even when I bought him a new house, because he couldn't figure out how I was making my money yet. <laughs> they just didn't get it, you know, because they grew up in an era where if you were a musician, you were a jazz musician, and all you did was play in nightclubs, and all the musicians were broke and poor. They didn't know anything about recording, and there were no albums when they were growing up. So all that was new at the time. And they just didn't know anything about royalties. They just didn't understand the whole concept of it. My dad was so sad. I'll never forget, he was almost in tears. My poor son, I thought it was great. It kept him out of trouble growing up, you know, playing the guitar. But now he thinks he could, crazy kid, thinks he can make a living playing the guitar, you know. And they didn't know anything about movies, scores. They didn't know anything about any of that sort of thing, you know. And it wasn't until I bought my father a house. He said, son, you don't, you don't have to do this. I know you can't afford this, you know. I said, dad, I made a million dollars this year. I'm only 22 years old. It's okay, you know. And so it, it actually took him a, a few years. In fact, he didn't even sell his other house for five years. He said, my son, he's going to fall flat on his face, and then I'll have a house to go back to. He was that scared, you know. And so it actually took him a long time to feel comfortable with the idea that I played music. Because for him, it was, it's invisible. He's like, well, how are you going to make money on something that's invisible? You know? And so it was, it was a different mindset for him. Well, the songwriting thing didn't happen for me till much later. Because all I wanted to do was play guitar on records. And when I was 13, 14, and 15, I played on like all of the Spinners records, Marvin Gaye records, Smokey Robinson records. And I was in, I'm sure you remember a group called the Funk Brothers. Okay, well I was sort of not one of the Funk Brothers, but I was sort of the group right after that. And the Funk Brothers, because they were at Motown, they weren't able to work for Holland Dozier Holland when they left Motown. So I did all of the Holland Dozier Holland records, like Put It In The One Ads and Band Of Gold and you know, all of those kind of hits. And then I would still go do some of the things at Motown. And, and to my credit, which I'm so excited about, the Funk Brothers gave me a a credit at the end of their movie, just because I used to hang out with you know James Jamison Jr. and all those kind of guys. But it wasn't until I met Stevie Wonder and he called me to be in his band, and I was about 17, is when I first started writing songs because he was writing songs in the hotel room all day every day. And so I said, well, I ought to be able to do that, you know. <laughs> so that's when I first got the inkling that maybe I should compose and do some other things. I think it's an important. It's a, I think what's important as a musician is to just do everything that you feel. Like I never set out to be a producer, I never set out to be a songwriter, I never set out to be any artist or any of those things. What I really wanted to do was just play my guitar. Okay, I just really wanted to play my guitar. And then when I met Stevie Wonder, he opened my world up to something new called songwriting. And I thought, well, I'm already in the music business while I'm playing the guitar, maybe I should write the song a little bit, you know. And my earlier songs were, they were all guitars. They were like 10 guitars, no bass, no drums, you know. So I had to work my way through that, you know. And uh, learning some of the other instruments, producing it and some of the other things. Producing came along. Yeah, oops. <laughs> yeah, producing came along simply because I was letting some people record my records and they, it wasn't turning out like I thought it should turn out. So I was saying to myself, this is easy. All you had to do was stick to the demo tape. What did you guys switch it around and put the orchestra and all that stuff on there? It doesn't need an orchestra. It just needs a rhythm section. So I started producing the records and they were t just turning out more like what I wanted them to turn out to be, you know. And same thing with engineering. I learned to engineer at ABC Dunhill when they used to have the old ABC studios because the sound wasn't turning out the way I envisioned it in my head. And so there's two things you can do. You can A, learn how to do it yourself, or you can find somebody you can project your idea across to. I don't know which one's hardest, you know, because <laughs> sometimes you'll go through 10 people trying to say, uh, that's not the way the guitar should sound. It's not. And finally, you just say to yourself, well, how much is it? You know, let me learn how to work the pots and learn how to, to mic the guitar a certain way so I can get my sound. And so for me, that was easier. And once you get it, if you're doing it yourself, you can, you can you know, replicate that many times over for years to come. I'm going to go back to Stevie Wonder again because Stevie Wonder's records, he played all the instruments, like Music From My Mind and Talking Book Album. You know, he couldn't play the guitar, which gave me an ed edge up. <laughs> so I got to play on his records. But, you know, that's him playing the drums, the harmonica, the keyboards, and everything. So since I learned to compose from Stevie Wonder, 
you know, he took me into the studio and showed me how to layer the instruments. And so that's where I got that concept of layering the instruments myself. Also, what also helped me to do that is I couldn't get anybody to help me at 3 o'clock in the morning when I got studio time. So there was just literally no one else around. So I had to trial and error certain things. And I, I wasn't such an egotistical guy that, you know, if the, if the piano part really demanded more, then I'd wait and get one of my friends to come in and help me out. So I just stuck to doing the things that I felt that I could do well. There's no order to how I would record first or no order to how I would write the song first. Sometimes I write the song on the guitar, sometimes I write it on the piano, or sometimes I just write it in my head with the lyrics first and then try to find music, you know, to fit the lyrics. And same with recording. Sometimes I put the guitar down first, uh, sometimes I put the drums down first, or sometimes I put the keyboard down first. It's just whichever one I felt comfortable on at the time, or that I had an idea for it completely through. At the time, I put that down first, then I start to layer on top of that. Pro Tools and the computer-based systems, in my opinion, have changed the entire planet Earth. Um, I was very fortunate five years ago to sell my studio which was American Studios, had two SSL consoles, two digitals, we had all student machines, probably about $4 million worth of equipment in there. And I can really truly do more upstairs in my bedroom on a Pro Tools system with a Mac computer that maybe I've got, I don't know, 50 grand in. And that's an extended version with custom pre mic preamps and microphones and the whole thing. And what, it, what has changed is now you can push one button and bring the entire mix, the entire song, everything back up the way it was. And you could say, I was riding in my car, I think I need a little more vocal, and just push the vocal up. And then go to the next song. You know, in the old days, we used to leave the song up for two, three days till we drove around in our car, got it right, then we go to the next song. Because you could never get everything back. Even the SSLs with Total Recall, they wouldn't, you know, they didn't, they didn't mark where the knobs were for the echo chambers and the, the exact amount of sin, the exact amount of everything. So it would always be a little bit different. And so this new equipment has just uh, changed the world. There's no more editing tape. Uh, in fact, my kids laugh about it. I said, we used to take a razor blade, cut the tape, right? You only get one crack at it, so you better cut it right. You know, listen to the sound, find a spot, cut the tape, and edit things together. Now it's all cut and paste. If you don't like it, you push the undo button and undo it. So you can work a lot faster. You can put different things together. You can take the sax solo from the back of the song and move it up to the front of the song. I mean, you know, the world is an open book now. Do you think there's a downside to that? There is a, the, the downside that I found with it is, like anything else, if you have too much of something, you spend too much time playing with it as opposed to writing a song and recording. For instance, once we got a drum sound up, that was the drum set, that was the drum sound. Now you have a choice of 150, 200 bass, bass drums. So you're sitting there for hours thinking, hmm, do I like that bass drum? Do I like that bass drum? And it really gets past the point. Either one of those bass drums is probably going to be fine with the song. But, you know, again, a lot of people have spent hours and hours and hours just perfecting a particular snare drum sound or something like that. So I had to regress from my uh, computer, you know, mm -hmm. learning days and go back to it. Just write the song. Find a nice drum set, find a nice bass song, and just start putting the song down. I think my favorite part is songwriting, because that is where everything starts. Um, the guitar part doesn't mean much unless it's on a great song, and what you're singing about really doesn't mean much unless it's on a great song. And I really admire um, some of the newer artists and the rap singers and all that kind of stuff, because they've really helped keep at least my catalog alive. You know, A lot of people now have decided, well, we don't want to learn how to play, we don't want to write. Fine, don't. Use my songs. Just put your lyrics on them, and everything will be fine. You know, so it's actually really made the catalog last a whole lot longer than anyone had expected, you know. But I think, for me, just creating something from scratch that didn't exist before and hearing it come back is probably the happiest times in my life. Hmm. Putting your song in a film can be unbelievably huge exposure for the artist because the films cost so much money that the money they spend on promoting you by accident along with your song it's chump change. That's not even what it costs to put posters on one street, you know. And you get the benefit of that. And your music is tied to that film for all eternity. And some of these film composers now, I mean, they're worth a billion dollars or something, you know. My hero, John Williams, is doing unbelievably well, right? I mean, he's making, like, you know, just huge sums of money. So I would always recommend an artist, if he can get his, his uh, song into a film, that would be a nice thing. It's difficult to write the subject matter of a film and not difficult. 
Uh, I think when you start on your own, you can cut anything. You can cut fast, slow, love, uh, politics. You can you may write anything. So it's conforming in one sense, but it also narrows where you're gonna go. Like for instance, if the guy says, I need an up-tempo song, I want saxophones in, I want violins, I want this or this, it's, your, your route gets narrower and narrower. And in my case, you know, my biggest film song was Ghostbusters, you know. And to me, that was an impossible song to write. I mean, because the first thing he said is, I want it up-tempo, I want this, I want that. I was like, oh, that's easy, blues channel. Okay, I got it, I'm a musician, I can cut it, I can cut it. Then he says, I want the word Ghostbusters in it. Okay, now we've heard the song, so it's a lot easier. But if you go back to when you never heard the song, and somebody, you sing, Ghostbusters, Ghostbusters, it's like, how am I gonna say Ghostbusters in a song? I'm ruined here, it's never gonna happen, you know? And we're not singing about girls, we're singing about a ghost, I mean, like, where is this coming from? And so, to me, I had to almost make it into a commercial, and if, I don't know if you noticed, but I never say the word Ghostbusters in the song. I let the crowd say it. And that's the only way I could get that funny word to fit the song. You know, so it just became one of those crowd chanting things. And I only had two days to do it. So my time constraint was really, really, really tight. And so that's how that whole thing just came about like that. And I think I was just blessed with the idea and everything to get it done in the two days, you know. You wrote the entire song in two days? And recorded it. And recorded it in yeah. two days? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so I wrote the entire song and recorded it in two days, and that just goes to show you what the human brain can do when you're under stress. It was almost like a kid who hadn't done his homework and started it two days before the, you know, the big due date. So now we're on to Ray records his new CD, which is very interesting, by the way, because I have not recorded a CD in 13 years, maybe 14 years. Uh, back in the early 90s, my parents got sick, and I had been pretty successful. And everybody wanted me to record, record, record. And I had all these things go on tour, do this, do that. And what was most important to me is my family. And my mother was getting older and my dad had caught cancer. And I wanted to move back to Detroit and spend time with my parents. Even though that kind of took me out the record business, right? Which is what I really, really love. I just, if, in my life, it was more important to go spend time with my parents as opposed to the other stuff. Then my kids were younger. After my parents both passed a few years later, then I want to spend time with my kids. And next thing I know, six, seven years have gone by and I hadn't recorded anything, which is okay. I wouldn't, if I had to do it all over again, I'd do it the same way. Now that my, my two older kids have gotten older and they're, they're just about to win. I got two younger kids, then I got married. Now I'm a happy guy again. So the title of my new album is called I'm Free. And I feel like I'm free because now I can record like I used to. I'm energetic. I've been touring the last two years with the Crusaders and different bands and working on different people's records like Smokey and, and Boss Gags and different artists. And I just feel like doing it. So this is a record that I've spent about two years recording. Has me playing the nylon acoustic string guitar, uh, the electric guitar, and the gut string acoustic guitars and something I'm very proud of, and it's a poetry album. It has some reggae on it, it has some blues on it, it has some, it's just different. It's just the new Ray Parker. It has nothing to do with me trying to recreate where I left off from the 80s or that kind of a thing. It's just all new. The new distribution of this record is gonna be Radio Music Corp. I'm gonna do it. And unlike most musicians who just make their records, and I don't know why they get to this stage, and then they just sit it there and think it's gonna sell itself. We're gonna hire people to go, I get a PR firm, we're gonna get promotion, the whole thing. Digital distribution now and all of that stuff is so easy to set up now on the internet. The only thing I haven't done right now is set up my retail outlets for the stores. But I'm gonna spend a lot of money on actual promotional dollars to get out to the street and make it visible. Buy ads in you know, trade magazines, buy ads in uh, just regular magazines that people read and do that kind of thing. I may even shoot an infomercial and show it at late night. <laughs> the market is really, really different now because what has transpired in the last several years is rap music is still maintaining its its place in the marketplace, right? And and so a lot of, especially my friends or people at my age, they're all scared of that. They don't know what to do. They don't know how to, to, to make their records. They're just trying to chase the beat of somebody who's 20 years old. I just think that's ridiculous and that's wrong. You should be true and cut what it is to yourself because the people that love us from that era who followed those records, they want to hear you do you. They don't want to hear you do the other guy. They already have the other people to do that. So what I try to do on this record is not chase any of that. You know, This is just true to itself and true to what it is that I would do. So I don't think it, the marketplace is that big a difference. Uh, I happen to be from a very 
large group of people called the war babies or whatever you want to call it. There's a lot of us there. And we don't go to stores that much anymore. We like the internet. And all of us have a little more money now. And we're just looking for something to do. And I noticed that every time there's a big concert or somebody reaches that audience, the concerts always sell out. Like you got the Paul McCartney concert. They can't sell enough tickets. You know, Prince came back. Boom. Everything's blowing up. So I think that just no one's really accurately reached the marketplace for this, for this audience right now. And so I'm going to try and do that. In the old days, you make a record, and I don't care, you could be writer, producer, artist, everything. You're going to get like a buck, 60 bucks, 70. Uh, I think at some point Michael Jackson was getting 195 or two bucks or something like that. And at the end of the day, the record companies would give you the money to cut the record, but then they'd own the master. Even after you paid the money back for the record, they take that out of your money, right? So now they got all the money back for recording that you paid for, and they still own the masters. And nowadays, if you do it independent, you can make, you know, eight fifty, nine bucks a record. And even if it's a little less, if you took off the dollar for making the record and other stuff. So even if you're making six bucks a record, now if you sell a hundred thousand records, you just make six hundred grand, as opposed to the other way you'd have to sell millions of records to get the same amount of money. And then they'd have written into their contract, well, we're going to pay you on 90% of that after we deduct 10% of this and 5% of this. And you really were probably down to a buck 10 or a buck 20 in actual, you know, what you got paid on. And so I think that, you know, things have changed now. It seems that the public doesn't seem to care what label it's on or they don't even know. You know, uh, CDs and everything have changed the world. Now we have digital downloading. There's, there's, it's really easy to get your stuff up and distributed, like I was saying before. Uh, you can get your things distributed out of retail. And it seems to be now, if you know how to spend the promotional dollars to promote your record, of which I must say, I'm a new guy at this. I'm not an expert. I'm going to try and hire some people who know a little more than I do who can help me. But it just, I'm so excited about the possibilities of doing it. I want to shoot the infomercial, which some of my good friends are going to help me with, you know. <laughs> and and with, so I'm going to buy time on that. You know, I'll take all the free late night time that doesn't cost much and see how it goes. Or maybe take like Fresno, California, buy some good time in that area and see if we get some response from it. See if it sells. That is the other thing, by the way, that I like about being older now. I'm not the new hot 19 year old so I don't have to be on all the radio stations the same week is what used to be so expensive you had to coordinate an effort where you could dominate the entire planet earth in one week that's not necessary anymore I can take one great idea like an infomercial buy spots in Fresno which maybe I can afford to buy in one market and we'll see if that does anything and if that does something then we'll take the money that comes off the records because now you don't have to wait two years to get your money to get paid, you can get your money in like two weeks. So we could take the money from that and maybe roll that over to Sacramento and just spread it like a, a, a great disease, let's say. Mm -hmm. And so I'm really looking, you know, to me that's very exciting to try to go out and do some of that. Oh yeah, yeah, I wanna hire somebody in radio promotion, somebody in marketing, somebody in you know the publicity department who get the trade ads or get the magazines like Ebony Magazine, People Magazine, all of that kind of stuff, Variety Magazine. and I want to take advantage of late night TV, which is a new medium that nobody's done much of. You know, I'm looking at TV late at night and I see Ace Cannon coming on there blowing a the saxophone and I'm saying, oh, that's ridiculous. Then I find out he sold millions of records and nobody even knows what the heck he's playing Waltz of the Danube or something, you know. So there's got to be some merit to that. And I'm sitting there saying to myself, well, I bet you some of my audience is sitting there in midnight thumbing through, thumbing like me. They got the remote control, which we all have now. And we sit there and thumb through the channels. And so I want them to thumb through and find Ray sitting right in the middle of some of that other stuff. Let's talk about confidence. I grew up, when I grew up, I was the nerdy kid. You know, my dad bought all my clothes at Sears and Roebuck. So my, I just had the wrong pants, the wrong shirt, and people thought that was funny for some strange reason, you know. I was busy into my music, so I didn't really pay much attention to it, but I just wasn't that popular, you know. And my best friend, Ollie Brown, was much more popular. He was probably one of the few guys that would talk to me. And around about 13, I grew an afro. So I got a little cooler, you know, and I switched to the electric guitar. Girls started noticing me, things started to change. And so for me, at an early age, I saw the difference between popular and unpopular. And me and my heart and my person, I didn't change. So in my mind, I had to say, well, what made you, what, what's the difference between popular and unpopular is just what the rest of the world thought, you know? And so I, I sort of saw that. And, and I always remember, there was always, seemed like two guys on his shoulders, one here, one there. 
there's the good guy over here and there's the bad guy over there. And I don't care who you are. I don't care how great you are. I don't care if you had a million records. This guy over here is very convincing. And he will say to you, I know you've had 13 hits, but that was it. You'll never get another one. <laughs> or if you're a new guy, especially. Well, yeah, you play pretty good, but you don't play as good as so-and-so. And that's what holds most people back. Most people are really afraid to put their picture on the front, put themselves out there, because they're afraid if something goes wrong, it's not like they're selling shoes or another product. It's their heart. It's their face in it. And they're afraid of being rejected by the world. They just can't take it. And I hate to say it, but unless you can get past that and experience the rejection a few times, you can never go on to be the big star that you would like to be because you will get rejected. There will be a day that you will stand on stage and you will get hit with a tomato. I promise you that. Or a beer bottle, you know, <laughs> or something else. And until you can do that, and get through that and work your way through that and respond to the public in a positive way, you're not ready to do it. Well, you overcome it by, you have to think about concerts that you did that were great. And when I say concerts, I'm not talking about as a star, I'm talking about little gigs you did as a kid. Uh, I remember playing Jewish Bar Mitzvahs when I was 13. And they would be so happy when we played the A-Train and I'd take my little solo on top of it. You have to go back to that. That group of people thought you were wonderful at the time, okay? And so, it's the same thing even when you have a hit record. I've done concerts with hit records that I may be somewhere in Alabama where all they want to hear is blues. And we're sitting there playing some other type of music and the guy's taking a beer bottle, playing some rock and roll, and he's throwing it at you. And so you just have to go through that. And I mean, I've seen shows where one night you can be in Washington, D.C., and there's 50,000 people at a baseball stadium. And you can go somewhere in New Orleans where maybe they didn't pay off the radio station DJ and they haven't even heard your new record. right? And you have no one there. So you have to put on a great show if there's 20 people there, just as great a show you put on if 20,000 people were there. And that takes some mental getting used to. You have to pre-program yourself to, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to walk out and I'm going to give it to them like this. You know? And when you can do that, it, you know, it, that's what makes your career. It can be learned. First of all, just about everything can be learned. <laughs> it's really true. Uh, I'll never forget a friend of mine who was a big producer, David Rubinson, told me years ago, and I think I was must have been 18 or 19, I was complaining to him about, oh man, Sly is so good, and Stevie's so good, and this is guys, this and this guy and that. Why am I here? Why, how am I gonna fit in? How am I gonna make this happen? And in his words, which was the best thing he could ever tell me, he says, you don't have to be the absolute best, right? He says, you can try to be, but even if you don't be the absolute best, he says, there's gonna be so many people moving backwards that if you just hold ground, you'll end up in the front. And sure enough, as I got older, a lot of people took themselves out doing drugs. A lot of famous musicians just thought they should kill themselves and die young at 27 so they could be immortalized, which I think is the most ridiculous idea, you know. And so a lot of people went back and I just sort of rose to the front, just holding ground, just working hard and just holding ground and just pushing forward. And that was probably the best advice he could give me of anything. Wow. I have so much words of wisdom for a new starting off musician. Because remember, I was one of those guys at one time. And it goes like this. Here is how you know if you should be in the music business or not. If you can picture yourself at 60 and you never tried to have a hit record and that's okay with you, then you don't belong in the music business. <laughs> but if you're gonna be one of those guys at 60 years old and you're gonna look at your kid and say, oh, I was just as good as Prince and Ray Parker. I, I mean, I could have done all that stuff. And your kids are looking at you like, <laughs> you know, if that's okay with you, then you shouldn't be in the music business. But if you're gonna be miserable, right? Because you only live on this planet one time. If you're gonna be miserable with that thought and you're gonna really say to yourself, every time you see somebody getting a Grammy, I could have done it, I should have been there, I should have been, then that's for you, you need to go do it, right? Because I think you can always get a job, you can always do certain things later, but if you really have it in your heart and you just can't live without this, that's how you know it's something that you should do. And then, if that is the case, then you have to dedicate your entire life to that and not backslide, not try to get things to not be a secretary and back up to this or not learn how to do drafting and have that as a fallback because you need to spend all your time doing what it is that you've really committed and decided yourself to do. It's almost like a war. It's like, uh, what is they said some of the great generals, they burn, blow up the bridge behind them. <laughs> and the guy says, well, how are we going to escape? Well, we're never going to escape. We're going this way. We're going forward. And so music is really like that. You, and And you have to have some, at least enough business sense to show up on time, be polite to people. You also have to have that personality too. 
So you just can't go off and offend everybody and say, I'm the genius, and turn your back to the audience. You really have to have both. So if, if someone really wants to do that, it's, it's really possible that they can make it. And it's not that one in a million that everybody wants you to believe. Because what they don't count is the other 900,000 people, some of them are getting drugs, some of them don't believe in themselves, some of them are doing it part-time. And it's like any other business, you know, you have to eliminate all the people who are not really trying. It's important for musicians to understand the business because if you don't, the guy who does understand the business usually makes all your money. <laughs> I don't know why that is. You know, it's, uh, it's just one of those things. As much as I like to tell everybody, be true to the arts, learn all you can, do great, play music, it's just a known fact that at some point, in order to keep the music alive, you have to make some money. You just do. Any great musician, at some point, if they really, really get under, they stop making music because they just can't do it. They can't afford to make it anymore. And if you, can, you, know, if you don't have any business sense at all, you need to be able to you know, com you know, combine yourself with somebody that does, who's not gonna cheat you, which is almost impossible. It's like getting married or something like that. But it has to happen. At some point, you have to have just enough businesses to keep yourself alive to keep making the music. And that, for us, is, pro is probably the most difficult thing because most musicians are so far to the left you know, they go spend everything in one weekend and wouldn't even make it to the next year. And I was looking at something on TV the other day about some rapper who made a, got a million dollars and spent it in two months. You know, and then he was gone. That was just it. He didn't even make it for the whole year, you know, let alone the rest of his life. And so there's something that's, that's uh, inherent about musicians or performers that the same craziness that allows you to get on stage in front of 25,000 people and think you're okay you know, it's the same thing that takes you off the other end. You know, it's the same, same animal. Mm. I'd like to say thank you to all my fans and people who have supported me over the years. And for those who don't really know what I do and just think I wrote Ghostbusters, you know, type Ray Parker Jr. on Google or something, and you'll get about 50,000 hits, and then you can read about it. 